workforce that many technical and trade occupations have earning potential of six figures. Such examples include electricians, where the median salary is $56,000, an MRI tech, medium salary of $73,000, dental hygienist, medium salary of $76,000, aircraft mechanic, $64,000, criminal investigator, medium salary, $83,000, and respiratory therapist, a median salary of $61,000. We can also count on job security. During the Great Recession, of the 7.1 million net jobs lost during the economic downturn that followed the financial crisis in 2007, nearly all were occupied by workers holding the little education other than a high school diploma. But only 3.2 million of the jobs added to the, during the recovery went to those without a college education. Since the Great Recession, almost 75% of new jobs have gone to individuals with post high school education or training. The current pandemic has only exasperated instability and job loss for those without degrees. 30%, 32% of layoffs in the first month of the pandemic were those with a high school diploma or less. 30% of those laid off had some college, but no degree. College graduates and those with vocational trades earn more money, live healthier lifestyles, have longer life expectancy, report greater satisfaction levels, and claim a higher quality of life. And that's what we all want for you. So with the cost of college and vocational training, we have to um, be, we can be prohibited and very um, burdensome for some families. Fortunately, there are resources for students. This workshop will cover what those are, but I wanted to highlight the California Student Aid Commission's Cal Grants. The commission is the principal state agency responsible for administering financial aid programs for students attending public and private university, colleges, and vocational schools in California. The Cal Grant is a California-specific financial aid allocation that does not need to be paid back. Did you get that? Does not need to be paid back. Cal Grant, keywords. Cal Grant applicants must apply for the FAFSA or the CADAA by the deadline and meet all eligibility, financial, and minimum GPA requirements for either program. Grants are for the students attending the University of California, California State University, or California Community College, or qualifying independent and career colleges or technical schools in California. This last year, my colleagues and I supported AB 1456, which would have streamlined the Cal Grant process and expanded access to post high school education for more Californians. Unfortunately, this bill did not go through and it was not signed by the governor. But we will continue our efforts in modernizing our, cal our, our funding uh, our grant process. And now I would like to take the opportunity to introduce our very own, our San Reno Community College District Chancellor, Diana Rodriguez, who's here with us this evening. And Chancellor, um, the Chancellor, uh, which includes her district, which includes Crofton Hills College in Yucaipa, my city, and San Reno Valley College in San Reno, which was a school my husband attended and my dad, Chancellor Diana happens to be the 16th Chancellor of the San Bruno Community College District with over 20,000 students. She is also, she also has the distinction of being a graduate of my alma mater, Cal State San Bruno. Go Yotes. Thank you, Senator Ochoa for your kind introduction. And thank you for your partnership in hosting this Cash for College workshop for our local students and our community. But before I go any further, I want to thank you on behalf of the San Bernardino Community College District for your leadership in Sacramento, specifically for advocating for affordable higher education and career training. We can't thank you enough for that. So thank you. And I know we have many students and parents joining us from Redlands, San Bernardino, um, Yucaipa, and all across the Inland Empire. So welcome to all of you who have joined us. And we have students joining us from my two all-time favorite colleges, Crafton Hills College and San Bernardino Valley College. So welcome and thank you for joining us. You know, let me start off by congratulating 
all of you on your hard work to continue your education after high school. You know, today you are taking the next steps to building a better future for yourselves. And if no one has told you recently, you belong in college. You absolutely belong in college. You know, when I first started my educational journey, I wasn't really sure that college was for me. I, I grew up um, in the city of Blythe, a small farming community in um, Riverside County, right next to the Arizona border. My parents didn't go to school. They didn't go to college, right? But they worked hard to give me and my siblings every opportunity that they didn't have growing up, much like our Senator here. Yeah. So after I graduated high school, right, I started taking classes at my local community college. And then I transferred and graduated from Cal State San Bernardino, right? So I know the struggles and the challenges of being first in my family to go to school, to go to college. I know what it's like to juggle homework, family, work responsibilities, and all of that, right? It's not easy. You know, and I know that many of you that are listening have experienced the same. Um, and but I am so glad, so glad that I did that, and I and I started on the educational journey that I did. Right, having a college diploma has opened up doors of opportunity for not only myself but for my family. Right, so let me tell you again: you too belong in college. I invite you to come to Crackton Hills College and San Bernardino Valley College. Come see what we have to offer. We have more than 140 programs that will give you hands-on training that you need to get the next well-paying job, to start your next career, or just to look into something fun, right? That might spark your interest into another career. So we have programs that will help you transfer to a four-year university. You can choose to take courses online or in person. All of our courses are taught by professors who are experts in their field and who genuinely, genuinely care about your success. Our students graduate with skills to be successful teachers, nurses, doctors, firefighters, police, social workers, auto mechanics, aeronautics, technicians, business leaders, you name it. We have a, a just an outstanding alumni who earned their degrees right here within our district. So let me give you our website real quick so you can jot it down, which will have just a ton of information. And that's www.sbccd dot edu slash learn www.sbccd.edu slash learn so thank you again everyone and welcome we know that you're going to enjoy this workshop and so i will turn it back over to you senator ochoa Bo. not to be a mute <laughs> technology for today. So thank you, Chancellor Diane, uh, uh, Rodriguez, for your, for your welcoming remarks. And now before we kick up the Cash for College workshop, I would like to remind everyone that enrollment period for financial aid open October 1st, 2021 to start college career training in 2022. The deadline is March 2nd, 2022 to be eligible for more financial aid. The state has grants available for middle-class students foster youth, military and law enforcement families, adult learners, and future teachers. Please feel free to contact my office for state and local resources to learn about scholarships and financial aid applications. We are here to serve you and help you navigate any state uh, resources that are available here in California. So please do feel free to give us a call or email us and let us know how we can be of service. Now it is my pleasure to introduce representative from the California Student Aid Commission, Edwin Chikukwa, right? Yes, that is correct, Senator. Thank <laughs> you so much for that introduction. Thank you so much also for having me here. I'm going to, let's see, I might need some screen sharing capacity. So can someone please grab me that really quickly? 
Awesome. Let me try that again. Let's see. It looks like I'm having some issues sharing my screen. Um, I would definitely suggest if you could make me a co-host, I think that would probably override that because I'm assuming participants can't share screen right now. Uh, so can I please have that access? Nothing like a little technical difficulty. I know, right? Time, huh? <laughs> All the time. There's always something with Zoom. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so it's still telling me that host has disabled participant screen sharing. Uh oh. There we go. Thank you so much. I know who that was, but whoever it was, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Awesome. So let us get into this Cash for College workshop. So once again, my name is Edwin Chikukwa from the California Student Commission. I go by Eddie, and I just want to let y'all know that this is a very personal thing for me. I'm the Cash for College coordinator for the Student Aid Commission. So my job is to go around the state of California giving these kinds of presentations. However, for me, this is personal because when I first arrived in the United States, I actually immigrated here at the age of 14. I didn't think I'd be able to go to college. And it wasn't up until my high school counselor actually told me about a workshop that was going on in my area. And so I went and visited the workshop and they really broke down financial aid. And I realized this is actually possible. So it's interesting enough that that was the actual cash for college program that came to one of the local high schools in my area. And now I'm actually coordinating that program. So it's, it's, it's kind of a pay forward, but I'm really excited to be here in front of you all. Once again, thank you so much, Senator, for allowing me to be here today. And with that being said, I'm going to start off by turning off my video because typically I've noticed when I talk about the presentation and the slides are up, it gets a little distracting because you're looking at my hands and you look at the slide and you're looking at my hands and you're looking at the slide. I don't want to do that to you all today. I don't want to give you all like some sort of neck problems just from looking back and forth. So with that being said, I'm going to turn my video off. We're going to go over a couple of slides just to give you a nice general overview of financial aid. And then I know we'll have an FAQ later where we'll discuss very specific questions. So let's get into that. So I already kind of walked y'all through what the goals are for today. So right when we start, we want to mention that there's two applications. There's two specific applications. There's the California Dream Act application, which is the CADA, that's what we call it. And then there's the free application for federal student aid. So two separate applications. Students, you're only going to fill out one of these applications. And to make it simple so that you just know right off the bat, undocumented students fill out the California Dream Act application, and then citizens and permanent residents fill out the free application for federal student aid, most known as the FAFSA. The, also, the other thing I want to try to get used to is hearing that when we talk of financial aid, it's not just FAFSA. Because I know a lot of times people hear FAFSA, and that's what they think when they think financial aid. But there is a California Dream Act application, and I want to make it very clear that undocumented students, you can get aid. So undocumented students, California Dream Act application, that is for you. Uh, permanent residents and citizens, U.S. citizens, the FAFSA, that is for you. So that's our first main distinction. Second thing we want to clarify is what tax information goes on the application. So let's say you've got your application, you figured it out, you're like, okay. I'm supposed to be filling out the FAFSA or I'm supposed to be filling out the CADA. And now you get to a bunch of these tax questions that are asking you about income and assets. And you're wondering when, what year of tax information do I report? Well, for these applications, we use what is called prior prior. So that means for this coming cycle, you would be using the 2020 tax year. So tax returns from that specific year. So it's always prior prior. Now, some of you may be wondering, hey, a lot has happened in the past two years. And you're not wrong. A lot has happened, the global pandemic and a bunch of whole other things. And so your current financial situation might not reflect what happened, um, what your 2020 tax situation say was. So you, there might be a discrepancy between the 2020 taxes you submitted as well as your current financial situation. And we'll talk about what to do in those circumstances, but that was what is called a special circumstance and there are ways to get around that. We'll discuss this a little bit later. But just remember for now, when you're filling out your application, you use prior, prior tax information. So for you all, 
of filling out the 2022-2023 application, it would be 2020 tax returns. Now, how much money can I get? That is the question of the day. That is why y'all are here. Like, tell me, show me the money. That's what y'all want to see, right? So this is how it's calculated. When you apply, you have the cost of attendance. So the cost of attendance is how much it costs to go to a school. Now, right off the bat, y'all should know there's a difference between community colleges, obviously, um, public universities, so UCs and CSUs, as well as private schools. All of those have a different cost, have a different cost of attendance. So it's going to be based off that specific school. Then there's the expected family contribution. This is what is calculating, this is what is calculated when you fill out all your information on your application, whether you're filling out a FAFSA or a CADA. Once you put in all that financial information, all that household information, the we calculate what is called an expected family contribution. So cost of attendance, minus expected family contribution, and that will give you your student financial need. And so that's how all this information is determined. So it depends on which school you're going to, what information you put in on the application, and then what eventually, and that is how we calculate, or that is how your school calculates what your need is. Now, how much federal student aid can I receive? So for federal Pell grants, it was, I believe we're about $6,000, about $6,195. And so that's how much federal aid that a student can receive. That doesn't mean you're going to get all of that, right? Because once again, students have different student needs. You know, one family might not be able to contribute as much as another family might be able to contribute to a student's education. So it varies, right? So, but the max for Pell Grant Awards is 6,000 plus, it's in that range, over $6,000, so $6,195. Then we have a thing called work study. Now I'm gonna take some time to explain this because this throws off a lot of people. And I also want to be very clear that when we're talking about federal aid, this is something that only FAFSA filers can get. Because the federal, because the FAFSA is a federal application, um, obviously it gives federal aid, whereas the California GMAC application is the state application, that is what's for undocumented students. So FAFSA filers qualify for both state and federal aid, whereas California GMAC application filers qualify for just state aid. So when we're talking about these specific federal awards, this would only be going to FAFSA filers. So I just wanted to make that very clear before moving on uh, so that there's no confusion around that. With that being said, federal Pell Grant, uh, we already covered that, federal work study. This is the simplest way to put it. Let's say Eddie wants a job at University of California, Santa Barbara. I actually went there, so Senator, we're both former gauchos. Uh, <laughs> I, what was that thing we used to say? I got your back. That was, that, that's what UCSB students say, but just wanted to throw that out there. But let's say I'm going to UC Santa Barbara, right? And I am trying to get a job. And the job pays $15 an hour. If I have what is called work study, and I'm using hypothetical numbers here, by the way, if I have what is called work study, what will happen is the federal government will pay a portion of my salary. So instead of my on-campus employer paying me the full $15 an hour, the on-campus employer will only pay me, let's say, $10 an hour, whereas the federal government uses that $2,400 a year to pay the other $5 an hour. So that makes me more of an attractive hire to these on-campus um, organizations or these on-campus businesses that do take work study. So that's pretty much what work study is. It's an incentive so that you, so that on-campus employers or organizations within that campus community that accept work study can hire you. And so it's a really great opportunity. We know that a lot of times students who have work study tend to get hired first because they're quite frankly cheaper to employ. However, the student is still getting the full salary that they were promised. Moving on, we're gonna talk about direct subsidized loans and unsubsidized loans. The first rule you should know about loans when you're taking out loans, whether it's subsidized or unsubsidized, is subsidized loans do not accrue interest while you're in school. I will repeat that again. Subsidized loans do not accrue interest while you're in school. They start accruing interest, I believe, six months after you graduate, unless you defer them for going to more school. Unsubsidized loans, the moment you take that out, it's, they start accruing interest while you're in school. So if you have to pick, if you get offered and awarded subsidized and unsubsidized loans, right, you want to make sure that you use your subsidized loans first before using your unsubsidized loans. Uh, that's just a quick pro tip. Just remember that subsidized loans does not accrue interest unsubsidized do. 
Then we're going to move on to the direct plus loan. This is for parents. And parents can take this loan out on behalf of their children. And the way this one works almost like an unsubsidized loan too, in that it does accrue interest while the student is in school. So this is just a summary of some of the federal aid that is out there. Uh, this is typically what students tend to get packaged with. Now we're going to move on to some state aid because thank you to all senators, we have some very generous state aid in the state of California. Actually, I believe we are probably the most generous when it comes to giving financial aid out of this, the majority of, out of the states in the United States. So first of all, we have our Cal grants, which if you attend a UC and a CSU, will actually cover tuition. At a community college, you have what is called the California Promise Grant, which is a separate application from the, from the application I'm talking about today. But you have the California Promise Grant, which covers tuition. And then if you get entitled to or awarded a Cal Grant, you can receive what is called a Cal Grant Access Award to help you with things like books, transportation, and different kinds of supplies. At private schools, um, the Cal Grant, it might not cover, depending on the private school, it might not cover all the tuition, it might cover all of it, it depends on the private school really, but it does cover some of it and it does go towards tuition and fees. And then we also have Cal Grant awards for those individuals who are going to vocational schools. So if you're trying to get some sort of certification at a community college or going to a vocational school, we actually have a Cal Grant award for that. And then we have a Cal Grant award for those of you who are, who have dependent children with you and are going back to school and are considering going back to school, in addition to um, getting the tuition covered at some of these institutions, you can also get an access award, which would help you with all the needs that may come up because you have dependent children. So those are some of the things. It's a very generous state program. It's a very generous aid program. And depending on which school you go to, in some cases, it can literally cover your tuition. Some other things that we have is the middle class scholarship. This one is available at UCs and CSUs, and it will cover up to 35% of tuition and fees. And I always like to bring this one up because we always get this question a lot, especially from middle class parents. What is the point of me filling out the application? Will I get any money? Yes, you can actually potentially get any money. And if it's not clear at this point, these applications are all free. These applications are just like this workshop, free. So you can fill out these applications for free, and even if you don't get anything, it doesn't hurt you, but there's a chance that you will get quite a bit of aid, as you can see. So with the middle-class scholarship, once again, that can waive a portion of tuition at UCs and CSUs. We also have the Chafee grant for foster youth. If you were in foster youth or ward of the court for at least a day between the age of 16 and 18, um, you may qualify for this Chafee grant. And the thing about the Chafee grant, it is a separate application. I will say this, it is a separate application, but it's a very short application. You only have to fill it once and you can qualify for up to 5,000 per academic year. In addition to getting potentially a Cal grant and a Pell grant if you are a FAFSA filer, or in addition to just getting a Cal grant if you are a CADA filer. And remember when I say CADA and FAFSA, CADA is shorthand for California GMAT application. FAFSA is shorthand for free application for federal student aid. So I, I try to use those words. I try to use the shorthand because you can imagine how much of a tongue twister it can be continue to say free application for federal student aid. Uh, I've said it enough times to the point where I'm good at it, but y'all get what I'm trying to say with that. Moving on, what do you need to know before you begin? So a couple of things, you wanna make sure that you get your name right. Now, this is something which sounds a little common because it's like, okay, you brought us to this workshop to tell me to get my name right. Yes, yes, we absolutely did because this is one of the biggest things people mess up is their names. And so the question is, how do we make sure that we get the names right? If you are a FAFSA filer, you wanna make sure that you use the name that is on your social security. So whatever's on your social security card, use that name. If you are a California Dream Act application filer, you wanna make sure that you're using the name that is on your school records. And so why do we, why do the names matter so much? I'll give you all some context. When you submit your application, right, we actually also get a submission from high school counselors and community college counselors and, for, and um, as well as four-year counselors who submit your GPA to us. In order for us to award a student, those two things need to match the application and the GPA upload from the institution. So whichever school you're currently attending, those two things need to match. 
Now, if the school submitted a name that is different from the name that we got on the application, those things will not match. And so that's why it's really important to make sure that you get that name right. And that is actually the most common reasons for applications not matching because people mess up their names. So yes, we are definitely telling you, please, please, please get your name right. And then each application has its own thing. So FAFSA filers, you have what is called an FSA ID. I believe will come up a little bit later in this presentation, but you have what is called an FSA ID, which is pretty much your login. It also allows um, your parents to sign the application. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, for CADA filers, you have a username and password. So you set up a, an account at our web, on our webpage, dream.csac.ca.gov, and you would set up a, an account there, and your parents would set up an account if you're a dependent student, set up their account, and that will allow you to log into your application. Another thing I do want to mention, emphasize on this portion is the email address used, because a lot of times students will use, because they think, well, this is school related, let me use a school email or an institution related email. Please do not do that. Please absolutely do not do that. Because what will happen is, if you're in high school, you'll graduate from high school. If you're in community college, you, you might go to a four year. And then you leave that institution and now you're off that server. And so now you can't access all this information that you previously put in. And remember, these are not applications, except for the Chafee, that you're gonna be filling out once. The FAFSA and the CADA, these are applications you're going to be filling out multiple times, maybe anywhere from two to six or eight years, depending on how long your college journey is. And we just recommend that all this information, you write it down and keep it in a place that is safe and secure. So who can apply for the FAFSA? Once again, it is US citizens, legal permanent residents, and certain designations, including refugees or those granted asylum, as well as T visa holders. So I know I mentioned this uh, a little earlier before, but that's who can apply for the FAFSA. So I just want to make sure that's clear to everybody. That's who can apply for the FAFSA. Creating an FSA ID. Remember how I said the FSA ID for the FAFSA specifically, right? Now we're talking about the FAFSA because the CADA does not have an FSA ID. It has a username and password. So back to the FAFSA. It has an FSA ID. So this is, once again, you need to create it. This is the first step students and parents must take before creating one. Something we want to be very clear about, it does require a social security number. The FSA ID does require a social security number in order for you to have one and in order to create one. And so if a student is filling out the FAFSA, then they should have a social security number If for the student. We'll talk about what to do when the parent doesn't have a social security number, but the student does. But yeah, you do need a social security number. You do need an email, obviously your name and your date of birth in order to create, a, so in order to create an FSA ID. So let's see, this is a bit of an abbreviated version. Let me just go back. Um, let's see. So actually, no, this is covered later on in the slide, so I won't jump too much. But some of you all might have some information on whose parent or whose information goes on the application. So in terms of whose information goes on the application, and this actually applies to the FAFSA indicator, we're going to do a little flow chart that should help you figure that out. And this will answer 99% of the questions. So if you're a parent in here and you're wondering, should my information go on the application? Um, this is a, who's, which one of us should go on the application? Or if you're a guardian, or if you're a student trying to figure out whose information is going on the application, please pay close attention to this particular portion. So the first question is, are your parents married to each other? If yes, then you report information for both parents on the FAFSA or CADA. So this, once again, this specific flow chart applies to both applications. So married parents, both information is going on. Do your parents live together? If yes, both information, both parents' information is going on the application. Even if they're, even if they're not married, if they live together, both parents' information is going on the application. If no, then the next question becomes, did you live with one parent more than the other over the past 12 months? If yes, you report the parent whose information you lived uh, more so with over the past 12 months. So this is a situation where your parents are unmarried, they don't live together, but you spent more time with one parent. The, time, the, the parent who you spent the most time with, that's the parent whose information is going on the application. If no, so you're in a situation where your parents are unmarried, don't live together, and you spend equal amount of time with them, then you report the parents' information who provides the most financial support. Now, in instances where, once again, 
the parent who you spend the most time with, who you're putting on the application, or the parent who provides the most financial support. If this parent has remarried, you report their spouse to. If this parent has not remarried, then you're fine, you're good to go. You don't need additional information. So that is a flow chart that pretty much covers whose parent information goes, and that should cover 99% of a lot of the questions surrounding whose parents' information goes on the application. Now, I uh, alluded to this earlier. So what happens when a parent cannot create an FSA ID? And we're still talking about the FAFSA here. So for Dream Act, um, for, for the California Dream Act application, this won't be a problem because both student and parent, regardless of having, even though they don't have a social, can easily create an account. So that's not gonna be a problem for the California Dream Act application. They just need to create a username and password. But for the FAFSA, if you're in a situation where the student has a social security number and the parent doesn't, that does create a bit of a situation, especially if the student is a dependent and needs the parent's information. And what being a dependent student literally means is it means that you need your parent's information as well as your parent's signature to complete the application. In that particular situation where the parent doesn't have a social security number, then the parent has to mail in a signature. And so the student would complete the application, print it out, the parent would sign it, and then they would mail in the signature. And when they print out the information, it would tell them where to mail it in. Because unfortunately, the parent would not be able to create an FSA ID. And once again, an FSA ID is how a parent signs the application. And now some of you may be wondering, well, what if the parent just says no? Well, in that particular situation, um, the student would not, the FAFSA filer would not be able to qualify for anything outside of loans. So when a parent is supposed to fill out an application, but doesn't, that automatically puts the student in a situation where they can only qualify for loans and subsidized loans for that matter. So it is very critical that if this application says you do need parent information, you are a dependent student, then it's very important to get that parent information in the application, as well as to make sure that the parent signs the application. And if they don't have a social security, then they can mail in the signature. Now, what if they're filling out the application, the application asks them for a social security number. In those situations, the parent should just put in zeros. So once again, yeah, that is the next slide. If a parent is filling out the FAFSA, they're filling out the parent information section for their student, for their child who does not, uh, who has social security, but they as a parent do not have social security and they don't, can't create an FSA ID, when the application asks them for social security information, they should just put in zeros. So for a social security number, they should put in zeros. And that is how they'll fill out the application. Now let's get into the California GMAT application. Who can apply? So first, it's undocumented students. And I absolutely want to emphasize the very next point. With or without DACA. Let's spend a little bit of time on this. There's a lot of confusion. I understand it's called the California Dream Act application. And so some people think only DACA recipients can apply. That is not correct. DACA recipients should be filling out the, um, the California Dream Act application. That's the one they should be filling out. They shouldn't be trying to fill out the FAFSA. That's the wrong application for them. The correct application for an undocumented student with or without DACA is the California GMAT application. So I just want to make that very, very clear. Um, I, we always like to emphasize this. You don't need DACA to apply for the California GMAT application. If you do have DACA, you should be filling out the California GMAT application. And then other statuses that um, can fill out, that should fill out this application if they're applying for financial aid are TPS status and U visa holders. And so, yeah, with that being said, that was a quick summary of financial aid. We always like to plug our social media. I cannot guarantee that we'll follow you back, but we will give you a lot of great resources and great information. Um, so please follow us on all these different social media platforms. And thank you, thank you so much. If you have any questions, you can always call us at the student support number at the bottom. And with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Senator. Thank you so much for the uh, rundown on financial aid. I know we had several questions coming up on, uh, and we'd like to have an opportunity to answer some here, some of the questions that have been coming through um, and have come through. So we would like to have an opportunity to get those addressed. Um, here's one, and I know we just mentioned it, but we'll, we're gonna just go ahead and ask it. My family's not low income. I don't think I qualify for financial aid. Should I still fill out the FAFSA or the California Dream Act application? 
Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And once again, there's so many great programs like the middle class scholarship that you could potentially qualify for. Um, there's so many, and if your family does need help, let's say if you do get loans, these loans which are offered by the federal government tend to be way cheaper than the ones that are on the private market. So overall, you can get, you could be missing out on a potential scholarship that you could be getting, and you could also be missing out on cheaper loans than you would otherwise get on the private market. So it absolutely should always fill it out. It's free. It won't hurt you. Perfect. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, Chancellor Rodriguez, would you like to ask the, the following question? Here's one that um, I hear quite a bit. Um, so I'm glad that it's asked here. Are there grants for foster youth, military families, middle class families? and law enforcement families? If so, how would one go about applying for those? Awesome, that is a great question. And that's a lot of different categories. So foster youth families, we have the Chafee grant. That's the one where if you are a ward of the court for uh, or in foster care, I think between the ages of 16 and 18 for at least one day. If you fill that application once, just once, and I believe it's, it's a very short application. If you fill it out just once, then you can qualify for up to $5,000 a year. And so it's definitely worth filling out. I know for middle class families, we just mentioned middle class. So that's the middle class scholarship. For military uh, individuals who are in the military, there's a bunch of different uh, programs. I believe there's the California Military um, GI Bill Award that you can, all of these awards are actually on a website. So you can go check out all these awards on our website and look into them. And if you're in law enforcement, uh, specifically for those who, might, uh, they might have lost a family member who was in law enforcement or any of that nature, then there is a law enforcement um, also award that's also on our website that you could potentially qualify for. So there's a lot of different awards for different demographics for whatever your background is. We just recommend putting in our website and I can write down our website to, um, let's see, I'll put it in the chat, but our website is csac.ca.gov. Once again, it is C S A C, so csac. Ca .gov, and you can find all this information there. Fabulous, Eddie. Thank you so much. We do have other questions here. And let's see. If I'm a dreamer or an undocumented student, should I fill out the FAFSA? No, you should not fill out the FAFSA. If you are a dreamer or an undocumented student, you should not fill out the FAFSA. You should only be filling out the California Dream Act application. And because and if you have filled out the FAFSA, if you're a, a dreamer or an undocumented student, the very first thing you should do is fill out the California Dream Act application. The next thing you need to do is contact your school and then work with them to fill out what is called a G55 conversion form so we can convert your information. So just wanted to put that out there because I know that mistake is often made and also part of the reason why we always mention CADA, CADA, CADA because of that. Eddie, when I start filling out the FAFSA or the California Dream Act application, what is the deadline? And also, when can I start filling that out? That is a really great question. So let's, 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 yeah, let's work it. So Senator actually brought it up October 1st. October 1st is when the application's open. So October 1st, your FAFSA is open, your CADA is open. You can actually start on that day. Now for four-year students, if you want to be entitled to a Cal grant, the deadline is March 2nd. That is a state aid deadline. So students who are attending four year universities, remember the Cal grant is the grant that covers tuition or can cover all, pretty much all tuition and fees at some public universities and can cover a portion of tuition and fees at a lot of private universities. And if you want to make sure that you are entitled to that award, because in California, we have an entitlement track and a competitive track. I will tell you right now, you have a better chance of winning in Vegas than you do of getting on the competitive track. So it's better you get in on the entitlement track, which all you have to do is make sure you get it in before March 2nd if you're attending a four-year institution. For community college students, you're, you actually have more of a longer deadline. You have up until September 2nd. So that is the deadline for community college students. Thank you. Questions are coming through. Um, and thank you, Chancellor and Eddie for that. Okay, so now the next one is, when I apply, how will I know how much financial aid I will receive? Who will let me know, the government or the colleges I want to go to? 
Gotcha, gotcha. That's a really good question. And it's a little bit of both. So when you apply, right, we recommend you set up a what is called a my a web grants account, a web grants account. Um, and that lets you know if there's still additional things that are needed. It can let you know if you qualify for a Cal grant. And the application can also let you know if you qualify for a Pal grant. So that you can find out from the federal government and the state government. What your specific award letter will look like, that comes from your college. Now, I think I saw a question somewhere there. Someone asked along the lines of, well, I've already filled out my application, but I can't see my GPA. And I'm assuming that person has a web grants, which sounds, shout out to that person because they're very much on top of it. Uh, just go talk to your high school counselor to go and upload that GPA for you. That's how you should take care of it. But the reason why I bring web grants account and why students should create one is they can actually track it. And it, I believe it's mygrantsinfo.csac.ca.gov. That's where you can actually check the progress of what the state is awarding you, what the federal government is awarding you. But when it comes to your specific award at an institution, that's going to come from your college in addition to what the state and the federal government is giving you. So Eddie, once I apply, how will I get my grants to help me pay for college? What does that look like? What's that process? So how you get your grants, which is great, which is actually perfect segue from the previous question. So you can check what you will get from my grants info. And uh, this is the web grants for students. Students can actually be empowered to check on their own. Now, how you will get it, you can know what you will get from the state, but you won't necessarily get it directly from the state. How you get that now is once you enroll in a college, they will then disperse your aid to you. So that happens at the college level and your college financial aid will kind of walk you through, this is what your financial aid package is. This is when you're going to get it. This is how you're going to get it. Slightly individual to each college, but they typically have the same kind of dates and deadlines, but that's how you actually get your money directly from your college. Thank you. All right. Another one here is, oh, this is a, a clever one. <laughs> if I have leftover financial aid monies, can I spend it on whatever I want? Does that include a European vacation? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this, this is a clever one. <laughs> you try to give me trouble on that one. <laughs> 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 um, so the way that works is leftover this does actually happen the the i believe the term we use is financial aid refund and so there's a situation where your college has posted your expenses then they've received your aid from the federal and state government and they've given you aid from their institution and there's money left over so you get this refund mailed to you as a check or it gets deposited in your bank account you are allowed to use that money for tuition books supplies all those different things transportation food all that other stuff um, that's what you should be using it for. <laughs> uh, I would recommend using it for a trip to Europe, but you know that's not something the financial aid office is necessarily going to track. But the purpose of that money is to be used for books, supplies, transportation, housing, and food, those kinds of things. And you could probably put it in there also as an emergency. Um, if there is anything, I personally would just think of putting in there for emergencies because even though you may have extra funds this time, perhaps next time around, you may not have those extra funds and that could be your like i'm always about saving and having that emergency fund um available to you so maybe that should be something that you may want to consider um you know if you do um, have extra money um, um during this round totally agree center excellent advice excellent so the next question is what is the first step I should take to fill out the FAFSA or California Dream Act application? So the very first step, if you're filing the FAFSA, it's creating that FSA ID account because the FSA ID, that's your login for the FAFSA. And then if you're a dependent student, I believe this question will come up and we'll explain what dependency is later. But if you're a dependent student, meaning you need parent information, your parents should also create an FSA ID account. And once again, remember that is tied to a social security number. If the parent doesn't have it, they can always mail in a signature. So that's the first thing that should be done. FSA ID accounts for FAFSA filers. For California Dream Act application filers, the first thing is setting up a username and password. So it's pretty much like setting up an account for anything that you set up an account for. Um, same rules go if you are one of those students who's a dependent student who needs parent information, your parents should set one up too. 
Uh, so those are the very first steps that students and families should take and guardians. Yeah. If uh, the following question is as follows, if I have questions while filling out the form, can I save it and come back to it later? Yeah, no, the applications allow you to have a save key so you can always come back in and yeah, fill it out from where you left off. Who can I ask if I have questions about filling out the form? Oh, that's a, that's a great thing. So it depends on the type of question. I know people hate it, defense answers, but I'll, I'll walk you through the different scenarios. So if you're one of those students with a special circumstance, I mentioned it during our presentation, where you're filling out the application, right? Mm -hmm. And certain circumstances would count as, let's say you put in your tax information, your prior private tax information, but that doesn't reflect where you are right now. That's a special circumstance. You lost a parent, that's a special circumstance. You went through a fire or COVID or anything of those, those are all different types of special circumstances. You also are not in contact with your parents, but the application is saying you need parent information. That is also a special circumstance. Special circumstance situations, we recommend just submit the application and then contact the college. That's who you should be going to for special circumstance situations. Now, if you're having issues, let's say with an FSA ID, you should probably be calling the Department of Education. They have an FSA ID hotline that can help you out with that. For so for FAFSA questions, we would typically direct people to uh, the Department of Education. They're pretty good with FAFSA questions. For CADA questions, that's us, the Student Aid Commission. You can always contact us. You can just look that up, CSAC, and you will find our number there. It's called Student Support. And so these are the different individuals you should be reaching out to. But if it's a special circumstance, like I mentioned, then that submit your application and then follow up with the college. Sorry, the next question that we have here um, is, if I have, um, what is the difference between an independent student, a dependent student, and how is that determined? Gotcha. That is, that is a really great question. That is a very relevant question for pretty much everybody who was trying to fill an application. So on both applications, I believe there's about 10 questions. Um, I, don't, I don't have all the questions memorized off the top of my head. Uh, that would be really cool if I did. But one of them will ask you, are you over the age of 24? Are you pursuing a graduate degree? Or do you have dependent children who rely on you on 50% plus or more support for income and stuff like that? They, it asks you those kinds of questions. There's about 10 of them. If you, as a student who's filling out the application, whether FAFSA or CADA, answer no to all of those questions, you are a dependent student. So that's how that is determined. And if you answer no to those questions, you're a dependent student. And what that means is you need parent information, parent or guardian information to complete your application, as well as a parent signature. So that's how it's determined. Obviously, like I mentioned, if you're filling out the FAFSA, and your parent doesn't have a social, they can mail in the signature, but they would still fill out the application. And where it asks for their social, they just put in 000. For the California GMAT application, because we know that the student and the parents will not have socials, um, the parents would just sign it by clicking a check mark if they are, if the student is a dependent student. Now, if the student is an independent student, let's say they answered yes to any one of those questions, then they will not need parent or guardian information on the application and they will not need parent or guardian information to complete the app to, to sign the application they just fill it out on their own and they're good to go and so that's pretty much how the determination has worked works out then that's what bringing back to my earlier point if you're a dependent student and you don't have that parent or guardian information you only qualify for loans so if you can't get a hold of your parents for whatever reason even if they're saying they don't want to support you that's something to contact the college about. But even if they're not providing any financial uh, aid to you, you and the, the application says you still are a dependent, then you still need their information and their signature. So that's pretty much how dependency works out. I think you've covered this, but maybe go into a little bit more detail. Mm -hmm. um, let's say I'm 21 years old. Mm -hmm. I don't live with my parents. 
-hmm. but the application is asking me for parental information. Do I have to put their information? And then also, what if I can't get their information or they're not willing? What, what are my options? Awesome, awesome, and yeah, no, that's it, that's a very good example to get right into it because I'm assuming all things being equal, let's say you answered no to all ten dependency questions. So if you're, and I'm assuming in that situation you're a dependent. So in regards to the fact that you're 21, because the actual age for you to be considered independent is 24. So unfortunately, even if you're 21, you're not there. Even if you're 18, you're not there. The, the Department of Education has set that age at 24. So let's say you are 21 and you answer no to all the dependency questions. You still need your parents' information. Now, in this particular scenario, this student's parents or guardians are saying they don't want to support the student. Regardless of the fact that the application says you're a dependent student, then you need their information on that application. And if they don't want to give it to you and you just submit your application like that and leave it like that, that's when you only qualify for loans. However, let's say there actually is something going on between you and your parents and guardians that you cannot contact them, you can't get in reach with them, or there's, there's a personal situation that is very, a, a very deep personal situation that uh, most reasonable people would say, yeah, maybe y'all should not be in contact with each other. That's something to go talk to your financial aid office about. So you would still submit the application because the application will ask you, would you like to submit this application for now without parental guardian information? And you can click that button and submit the application. However, you need to check in with your college. Your colleges have different metrics for calculating or deciding that, um, but they do have the power to decide that. We at CSAC cannot decide that. Department of Education does not decide that. It's your college. So they will have the power to overwrite that. But yeah, you definitely want to make sure you get parent information. Being 21 does not make you an independent student alone in itself. Thank you. I'm sure there's quite a bit of kids who are disappointed to hear that. I, <laughs> I was too. I was too. <laughs> um, here's another one. Um, so my parents don't have income or file taxes. Can I apply for financial aid? Yes. So if your parents don't have income or don't file taxes, there's an option to say will not file or did not file. You still need to report their income on the application. So you can put in zero, that happens. And the application will just continuously go on like that. So that is not a problem. We just recommend, please be honest with the application because I think is, I believe it's one out of five cents a second for verification. And that's when we'll ask for documents to prove. That's when the financial officer asks for documents to prove is this information reported correct? And you do not want to be caught lying about that. So please don't lie on the application. But yes, even if your parents did not file or have zero income, they can you can still fill out the application. Whose tax information should I include on my application? So yeah, that, that goes back to that whole who's my parent in, uh, graphic. But remember, if you're an independent student, then it's only your tax information. So if you're an independent student, you answered yes to one of those 10 questions, or you're 24 years old, or you're pursuing a graduate degree, or you have children of your own, yeah, then you're only putting in your tax information. Now, if you are a dependent student, then you need your parents' tax information too, in addition to your information. And which parents' information goes on, that goes back to that graph, where if your parents are married, you put both the information. If they're not married but living together, you put both the information. If they're not married and they're not living together, then it depends on either who you're living with more. If you're living with them the same, then it depends on who's providing more financial support. So that's pretty much how that works out. Thank you, Eddie. We have another one that's, I think, a very good question as well. It states, what if I'm a U.S. citizen, but my parents are undocumented and mm. don't have a social security number? Mm. FAFSA is asking for my parents' social security number. What should I do? So one, your parents should not create an FSA ID. They should not create an FSA ID. That's the first thing. Two, they should still fill out the application, though, the FAFSA application. They should still fill it out. And whenever they're asked for a social security number, they should just put in zeros. And then three, once you submit the application, don't forget to print out the signature page so that they can sign it, and then they should mail it to the address that is um, listed on the signature page. And that's how you would go about that. Okay. 
So the next question is, do I have to have DACA to qualify for the California Dream Act application? Absolutely not. You do not need DACA to qualify for the Dream Act application. I wish like I had a poster that I or a billboard I could put in every city because that, that always comes up. But no, you do not need DACA. But if you do have DACA, you should be filling out the California Dream Act application, not the FAFSA. Thank you. Oh, all of you are such great questions. I'm so impressed. Um, so here's another one. I got financial aid last year, but I did not get a financial aid, but I did not get financial aid this year. Do I have to reapply? Yes. So every year you have to fill out these applications. Uh, either if you're a FAFSA filer, every year you have to fill out the FAFSA. If you're a CADA filer, every year you have to fill out the CADA. The only application that you don't have to fill out yearly is the Chafee Grant. Chafee Grant is for foster youth specifically. And once again, the rules for that is if you are a foster youth for at least a day or a ward of the court for at least a day between the ages of 16 and 18, then you would qualify for the Chafee Grant. So that's the only one that you only need to fill out once and then you're good for the rest of your college career. But all the other ones you fill out yearly. Next question. I think this is this is a good one because this would be me. <laughs> if I make a mistake on my financial aid application, can I go back and correct it? Absolutely, yes. You could definitely correct it. We see all kinds of mistakes. You know, some people fill out the wrong year. <laughs> some like some people. Once again, the name thing. I, I keep telling y'all about the name. You think it's ridiculous, but yes, that does happen. Um, yeah, you can always go back and correct your application as long as the cool thing is. Even if you do it after the deadline, as long as you submitted it before the deadlines, you're fine. I know, I, I'm with you, um, Chancellor Rodriguez, um, as far as wanting to know about the mistakes. What are some common errors students should be aware of? Ooh. Oh, I have a list of these. Um, so <laughs> we start off with the name thing. I always like to emphasize that because that is the most common reasons applications do not match. So get your name right. That's number one, get your name right. Number two, fill out the correct application. So if you are, once again, if you're undocumented, you should be filling out the California GMAT application. If you're a permanent resident or US citizen, you should be filling out the FAFSA. So fill out the correct application. Number three, Get your application in on time, please, please, please. Like, it doesn't hurt you in any way to get it in on time. There's, there is no negative consequence to getting your application in early. Actually, one of the more positive consequences of getting it in early is if you apply today, around in October, you could know by the time you get to late November whether you qualify for a Cal Grant or not. And so you could know that information really early. And for some of y'all who are thinking about going out of state, I know that might probably change your decision. So. Get it in early, figure that stuff out early and it allows you to give you more time to um, you know, digest what you're getting. And the fourth thing which I'll mention and I'll end on this is do not just submit and forget about it. Please don't do that. Because remember how I mentioned verification earlier? Sometimes you can submit and you complete and then you get selected for verification and now you need to submit in additional documents. And so what will happen is a student will go to their college campus. They're like, I filled out my financial aid application. What's going on? Where's my aid? And the college says, we cannot give you aid because you actually did not um, submit these additional verification documents. Or you had a issue that you did not correct. And so please don't just submit and walk away. Really read the confirmation page. Sometimes it will tell you that there's something wrong in your application that you need to go fix. Please go check that out. Or sometimes it'll send you an email later saying, hey, you did, you need additional documentation or you need additional stuff. So please don't just submit and walk away. Check to make sure everything is good to go. Check your emails two weeks afterward to see if you've gotten any communication um, from either Department of Ed or the Student Aid Commission. And just make sure you're proactive the entire process. So thank you. do I need to register for the selective service? to qualify for financial aid? So this actually is a recent change and we can actually thank the Senator for this. So what previously you used to, but now the way it works is selective service will no longer be required to qualify for state or federal aid. So that is a new rule that literally happened like two weeks ago. 
slave slaves are no longer required. Now it is still legal, like males uh, between the ages of 18 to 25, if you're applying, uh, you should be registering for selective service. That is a legal requirement, but it won't affect your eligibility for state or federal aid. So it won't affect your eligibility for financial aid. Thank you. Uh, great questions. Eddie, um, I know we have many more questions out here. I'm, I'm looking at our list here. Um, would you indulge us with just one more really quick? Because I thought this was an interesting one, and that is what happens when you marry and your spouse is your provider? Mm, what happens when you marry and your spouse is your provider? Um, and is this individual now the individual who's filling out the application and they are spouse are the one who's providing that income? Yeah. So in that situation, typically what we recommend is that, first of all, you'd be an independent student. So you'd be an independent student and that would be awesome. Now, if you're providing, if you're getting financial assistance from your spouse, that is income. So you should be including that kind of income on your financial aid applications. I'm sorry, I had to do that because I was just, there's so many more questions, but um, Eddie, if there are more additional or additional questions, where and how should they uh, address them? Yeah, no, so if there are any additional questions, please feel free to email student support. So that's one word, student support at CSAC, so C-S-A-C dot C-A dot G-O-V. And once again, it is student support at CSAC dot C-A dot G-O-V. And we should be able to pretty much get to your questions pretty quickly. Okay, so for Andrea, Joseph, Carla, uh, Gio, you um, have an anonymous one, please know that um, I'm sorry we could not have enough time to answer all of your questions, but they are important. We do want to make sure that you do get the answers that you find helpful. So do reach out and um, email and get those answers. Um, uh, those get those answers that you need uh, to move forward with your um, application. But I just want to let everybody know that I appreciate Eddie. Thank you so much. I got you back uh, uh, here <laughs> any time, and we'll, we'll have you come at you know at any time. Anything that we can do on our end, please let us know. Chancellor Rodriguez, thank you so much for your time today and for your support, your encouraging words in the beginning, and for those students here that are uh, pondering on their future and um, and what path to take and how it is. Be not afraid, my friend, and make sure that you follow your dreams. Um, and know that there is help out there. Just get the mentors, get the resources around you and know that everything is possible. Let your American dream come true, my friend. Take care. Um, Chancellor Rodriguez, any closing remarks? Yeah, I just want to thank you, Senator, for hosting today's workshop. It is so important that our students around our communities um, get this information. And um, Eddie, rock star, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your incredible knowledge. We appreciate it. Um, and, our, and to the students who are listening, be sure to start filling out your financial aid application. Start now, start tonight. Um, we're here to help if you have more questions along the way. And again, just thank you for being here. And um, you belong in college. Looking forward to seeing you on our campuses. Have a great night. Thank you and good night everyone. Have a wonderful evening and a blessed week. Take care. I think I, I think we're done. Angel, are we all good? Or Heather? I think so. I know Angel was having difficulty with his computer and then mine started acting up as well. So, well, well again, thank, thank you all on behalf yeah. of the district for joining us. We appreciate it. And you all have a fantastic evening and rest of your week. Thank Take you. Care. Likewise. Take care. Eddie, let's keep in touch. Uh, fellow gauchos, you know, we've got, well, actually, both of you, both, I, I, we're both colleagues on both sides, one at UCSB and one at Cal State San Marino. So 
Yeah. So excited to be here uh, in collaboration with both of you. And I truly, truly look forward to future collaborations as well. Just take care. Thank awesome. you. Thank you all and so much. Isn't time, Jasmine Rodriguez, 645. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Later, Thank you. Hey, Angel. Ah, Angel. Hello, hello. Ah. I'm going to go ahead and email you, but I wanted to see how we would be able to link um, this recording and kind of incorporate it into our uh, social media posts. But I'll, I'll go ahead and email you. Thank you. Thank you, if you can hear me. <laughs>